Where would you say the thinking comes from around, I've got to be mechanical in nature in order to achieve success? Where does that come from? You know, that is a fantastic question. But I think there's a there's a huge gap between what we would call our frontline associates from leadership okay. and that we incompetently just promote the best performer. That's what we do is, you know, you're not the best leader, you're not a group you know, guy. We don't even know how to really articulate what we want out of a leader most of the time. We just go, you move pallets on a forklift the fastest. Welcome to leadership, bud. <laughs> What's going on, l &M family? That is my buddy, Mr. Jake. Harold. Not only is he the funniest lean guy on LinkedIn, he's also the author of Chasing Excellence and a YouTube superstar. Makes you wonder, does this dude ever sleep? Well, I bet his passion for continuous improvement has a little something to do with all of his accomplishment. That and he just wants it more than anybody else. So we got about 55-ish minutes or so of, of some, some straight up leadership talk. There's a few jabs thrown, which, which ain't bad, and lots of laughs. I wanna remind y'all, we have some exclusive, hot and sexy, fans only content. Hit us up at patreon.com slash learnings and missteps to get access to that stuff. We're grateful that you joined us again. Let us know what you think. And if you're catching us on YouTube, spank that like button, baby. Come on with it. Give us some love. Here we go. We are here with Mr. Jake Harrell, the funniest lean guy you've ever met. Man, I'm glad we connected. I play around in the, the CI continuous improvement space in the construction industry. I mean, you're you're in the manufacturing industry, is that correct? A lot of my career, it started in manufacturing, but all the growth of the last five years has been in third-party logistics. So we're a warehouse that ships and receives for other people. That's been ninety percent of it. Okay, so there's plenty of plenty of problems to attack, huh? Yeah, so it is just people in the third party game. We don't own any freight, we don't own any assets. It is where we're it's leading people to ship and receive and process correctly every time. People, are they not just the most beautiful contributors? You know, it is my favorite part of the job is I've never been in a support role as some people might think it's like an engineer or a CI specialist. I've only been in direct leadership roles. And my favorite part is like the development and coming to terms with where people are today and helping them find their way forward. Lead them where they're at. That That's powerful, man. And with your sense of humor. So you're on a you're on a string of funny memes on LinkedIn. How many days in a row are you at now? Well, you know, that's funny that you say in a row, because I committed a year ago that I would put something out just about every day. But like assessing my LinkedIn algorithm, if I drop it down to like three times a week, I get like 10 times the engagement. So really? like slowly over the past week or so, I've been trying, playing around with, do I post five times a day? Do I post twice a week? And I'm taking, as a nerd, I'm taking a two-sample t-test. So what is, the, what is the right way to do this? And I found, like, the less I post, like, I'll get 50,000 views on a text post. And, and I'll post a chip every day and get less than 1,000 views on each one of them. So to really? try to find what works the best, and I'm still playing around with that. But I'd say in the past year or so, I've, I've probably posted about three, 400 times. My goodness, that's that's commitment, my man. So text, you said the text post is getting you tons of views. And when you're posting every day, that seems to be throttling back the views. Did I get that right? Yeah. And so in order of importance, text gets the most, then GIFs, then images, then videos. And my videos will get like one or 200 views. The text post averages, or an image averages around 12 to 1300. A GIF will get like 15 to 17 on a regular post. And then every text post I put out there gets 10,000 views. Like wow. Wrong. Man, you got game, my man. <laughs> well, the important thing is I'm not selling you anything. You know, it's like I'm not yes. on every single post like, well, send me money. <laughs> it is just let's take the pain we've all experienced in leadership and make it funny, engaging, try to teach a lesson.
I love that. I, I, you know, I was having a conversation with some friends that I've connected with on uh, Clubhouse, and I'm a I'm a pretty I'm a rookie, right? I'm I'm young to the Clubhouse game, not young in life. They've taught me a lot about how, what's the word. They've helped me appreciate promoting oneself without being that sleazy, slimy, salesy. Well, I shouldn't even say salesy because there are respectable professional sales folks out there. But just that self-serving, right? That self-serving impression that I get from some people that, you know, buy, 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 me, 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 me. And, and so we, anyway, we were just having a conversation about that the other day. And I'm like, you know, I, I, oh, I'm not okay with it. But bottom line, it, it's really about connecting with people and providing value to their day. And it sounds like you have the rest that you figured out, broke the code for that. I, I, I don't think that I'm there. Every time I look at a bad post and like it only got 200 views, I'm like, what did I do wrong? And I wallow on self pity for about four hours. But I'm trending it. I have a stupid amount of data in an Excel spreadsheet where I'm, tr I'm trending what do I want to do with this just so I could correlate the two. I've got far reaching dreams of sharing that in an article or video of some form. Oh, man. I think people will be kicking down the door to get that information. <laughs> well, uh, it only, it's only relative if you're like in the BS game that I, I am. <laughs> it's like, you know, actual educational content solely. I mean, you're playing a whole different game than somebody who's just poking fun at everyone else on LinkedIn. <laughs> 10, four. So Jake, what do you want the L&M family out there to know about you? Well, I'm the funniest guy in engineering and continuous improvement. And I have a genuine passion for talking about it. So if you just have a complex problem, like I'm not trying to sell you anything, just reach out and talk about it. Like mm. I, I will get knee deep in any problem just to help you solve it because that's what I enjoy doing when I wake up in the morning. And so based on the Excel spreadsheet that you referenced earlier, I imagine you have um, a deep appreciation for data. Uh, very much so. So the the trickiest part for me, which I can go as technical as you like here, but I have to take whatever nth level of data I've dug myself into and I have to translate it into layman's terms. So I have to get the average human to go, does this actually make sense instead of me talking about the standard deviation? Yeah, and I still don't understand standard deviation. That's come six sigma world. Yeah, that math, like if if it includes more than like a plus symbol, I, I start getting lost. <laughs> well, it's fascinating when you compare it to humans. So basically the statement is this in the most layman's way, and that's you can make any statement about humans, any statement. And there is a human somewhere that exists outside of the bounds of the assessment you just made. Like I can say, what percentage of people lick their boots at the end of their workday? And you might go, holy crap, ew, nobody. But there exists a percentage of people somewhere where that is happening today. And I try to emphasize that when I'm like, meet people where they're at, okay? Because the spectrum that humans live on is very, very wide. How did you develop the mindset and appreciation for, for exactly that? Well, it was a series of misanthropic, terrible work experiences that all culminated into one great one. So my career started uh, doing clerical work for a manufacturing company. And I was my first salary job. I made like 12 bucks an hour, but on salary. And I decided yeah. I'm, I'm gonna spend every other second I can creating value here and you know, taking my first shot at a career. And I had this fantastic leader, his name was Ryan Powell, and he gave me access to do anything I wanted to touch. He saw a passion in me and he took a shine to me and Sure enough, before you know, I sort of was put into a special role where I got to just do improvement projects. Like that was mm. my full time job. Get involved with the manufacturing facility, look at how it's done today, come to terms with it, make it better. And uh, that was pretty good for a while. Well, they released him. It ended up working out with me a little ways after I joined the 3PL game where I was headhunted for a large public warehouse facility. The culture was mixed, to say the best, and nobody really <laughs> wanted to improve anything. But they wanted the problems fixed. And as I navigated that, uh, I then again worked myself into a role where my full-time job was just going to be process improvement and getting involved with what people are doing and making it better. So it's twice in my life. So I thought, I'm going to work backwards and formalize all this stuff. So it wasn't actually until 2020 I went after like the Six Sigma Black Belt and 
go to school for it and formalize those skills. But I have been doing that work for the past five years. Okay. And so before 2020, what resources did you have access to to build those capabilities? Well, in 2019, I worked for a very large third-party logistics center, and I got moved from one warehouse to a gigantic one, this 1.2 million square feet. And I met my new boss, who would go on to be my very best friend in the world, John Thacker, and Lean Six Sigma, Black Belt, MBA, very educated, put-together gentleman. And he immediately created the space that he saw how bad I wanted to win for. We're going to call you and set an operations manager. I was on an overnight shift on the weekends. I said, we're going to call you a continuous improvement operations manager. You're going to come in whenever the hell you want, as long as you define a problem and want to win. And I started coming to that place 24-7, any day I could walk through the door and engaged in it so well. And it's been since then, I've worked backwards to formalize all the skills one at a time. Okay, so uh, it's a dumb question, but how important is leadership in creating a space for continuous improvement? That is their only job. Like I had to <laughs> Everything else you're doing is in the way. Like just create the space where we're allowed to experiment, be okay if it doesn't work out, and get people formalized tools and processes to, hey, I, notif I noticed this was the failure mode. This is what I'm doing about it. And as soon as you build that, then you have the grassroots culture you want, and you have people doing your job for you. So it sounds like John Thacker, like that's just how he rolled. That's how he did things. He saw something in you and, and nurtured that and helped cultivate where your thinking is. Was that something he did regularly? Yeah. So our relationship started with, he, we were just connected on LinkedIn because we worked at the same company. We didn't really know each other. And he posted out, hey, here's a copy of my book I'm working on getting published. But somebody that's in operations like to read it and give me some feedback. So I read the book, really loved that there's practical tools about how to overcome human problems and that I felt didn't exist anywhere else in the world. I gave him a whole bunch of feedback. He said, feedback, so good. Can I come over and hold a training class with his team? So I came over and he said, you're going to come work for me. And that's like where the career took off ever since. In fact, after writing his book, I was so inspired. I wrote this book, Chasing Excellence. This nice. Nice and good. Yeah. Hired by, by good old John Thacker. His name is in the very front of the very first page for that exact reason. And that is because, you're not going to be able to read that, but that is because he just decided, he said, I want everything I touch to turn to gold, and that includes you. And mm. that's resonated with me the rest of my life. Oh, man, that that's... That's a beautiful story. I, you know, on one hand, applause, recognize, shout out, John Thacker, thank you for setting the example and in, in investing in people. On the other hand, it, I know, and you probably, I think you alluded to this, experienced some leaders that were less than awesome and, and didn't create a space where people could grow. It almost creates a space where people are dying on the vine. So, so since working with John Thacker, how many leadership problems have you had the fortune of tackling? That's, that's quite a question. So uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what I can and can't talk about. So let me say as general and as specific as possible. My favorite one and example I constantly refer to was a previous leader of mine was an absolute chameleon. And what I mean mm. by that is he didn't have an opinion about anything on earth, period. No matter what it was, it was this middle of the road political response about how we're not really going to change that or do anything about it. But he was the first guy to have a problem when something went wrong. So yep. you're not allowed to change. You're not allowed to stay the same. It led me to post a meme on LinkedIn that was Harry Potter in the closet. He goes, I'll be in my office doing absolutely nothing and pretending I don't exist. Until he was pissed off about something, I gather. This happened. It's so embarrassing. I'm like, well, you know. Guys wanted to address it first, but every time they try something, they get their head cut off. Why would anybody stick their neck out? The, the thing is, in, in continuous improvement, that I've, I think a lot of leaders that aren't versed in it, there's a lot of failure, right? Because it's a bunch of experiments until something works and, and proves the hypothesis. Like you, you keep 
trying, testing, sampling, and then, okay, boom, this is the thing, and let's now let's systematize that, standardize the thing. But most, I think a lot of the conditioning in our professional environment is grand slam every time or you're failing. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, another coworker of mine lovingly referred to this as a cult of success. And mm. it's where the group uh, as a whole is not allowed to have anything outside of 100% perfection all the time. And that uh, failure isn't to be talked about. It's embarrassing when it happens. It only happens to weaker and inferior people. And we've built this cult of success. We dance around the flame and everything's perfect all the time. And that's largely been my working experience just about everywhere else. The first time something's not perfect, there's a head rolling. There's, well, this person is like, it's ethically correlated. Where it's like, this is an inferior human being for having this defect. Instead of, you know, coming to terms with the fact we're all fucking humans, <laughs> that's always been interesting to me. I've made a, a meme just uh, two weeks ago that kind of hit on that topic. And it says, I don't actually do any work, so I can do no wrong. And that makes me <laughs> Dude, yeah. Like, isn't there a, an Eisenhower quote about being in the arena? The same message, mm -hmm. right? Like, you can talk smack from the bleachers, but if you ain't in there making it happen, like, please shut your mouth. I mean, that's not what Eisenhower said. That's my version of it. <laughs> well, you can get in the arena and keep your opinion to yourself. Yeah. I, how could I mess up if I just sit back? How about ego? What are your thoughts about the battle that leaders have, their ego and attachment to status, and actually facilitating a culture of change? Yeah, that's a, that's a rough part because what we get into is a bit of a philosophical gap I don't like to think of it generationally, even though it essentially is, but this idea of company loyalty it, that's been around since World War II is, is largely dead today. So what you have is you fall into two groups, and the older you go, more come lens into this group A, which is, I'm going to hold on to this job the rest of my life, and that's my very first goal. Whenever I assess problems, I'm thinking, how do I keep my job, or how do I politically navigate my way forward? Then everyone in group B that no longer lives like that is, how do I create the most value I can today? That's what they care about the most. And the two groups inherently will never see eye to eye on anything <laughs> because group A just wants, I want to keep my job. And group B is like, well, you're literally in the way of this place moving forward. And that's been a struggle for just about every role I have. Except in, until my most recent career inspiration, aspirations, it, that has been the case. but. I'm finally in a spot where that is not, and we're quick to come to terms, address problems, get to work, and uh, put the sweat in to make it better. Oh, that's you said it. Sweat equity. You you gotta put the sweat in, otherwise you just you just jam in your jaws. So you said this new career uh, trajectory or endeavor you're on. What is? Well, I haven't announced that into the world on LinkedIn, but I'm still in the third party space. I'm still doing the same job I ever had just with a new company. And it's still really new, so I'm four weeks in, so I know I'm looking through the world with rose-colored goggles, where it's like the first six months of dating, and like, gosh, she's perfect, and there can be yes. no wrong. But, <laughs> but ask me that again in six months, and I'll give you an opinion that isn't incredibly biased. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. It's just fascinating how, how paralleled our, our situation is, because I just submitted my letter of resignation and I'm going to be moving on to a new, sexy, beautiful, wonderful situation that I too am only seeing through rose colored glasses. And I have a ton of colleagues that are just like, what in the hell are you thinking, Jesse? <laughs> but it looks perfect to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm working from home these days. And so I'm coming to terms with that for the first time in my life. Instead of spending 12 hours a day in a warehouse, I spend it at home. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to think of that, but I am four weeks in, and I think it would take a shovel and a gun to get me to go back. I used to uh, freak out about not being at the job site or not being at the office before everybody. I mean, there's a few people in my career, Sean Moran, Rick Mendoza, Justin Beard, that like we had to stop competing to get to the office first because we would just end up spending the damn night, right? So we was like, okay, let's meet early in the morning, no later than 6 a.m. 
Well, anyhow, the pandemic hits and it's work from home because my job was a traveling role and I was crawling in my skin for a bit. But same thing, if I didn't have the op, like the flexibility to do a uh, hybrid of work from home and, you know, out in the field and out at the office, uh, yeah, you better go get your shovel because I could just get so much more done. There's so much, like just the waste of traveling, commuting, I can get going as soon as I wake up in the morning, knock some stuff out when my brain is really functioning. So... I'm suspecting there was a windy path to you getting to the spot where appreciating data, defining problems, uh, understanding the contributing factors, and then doing some experience to make things better, right? To, to turn them to gold. So in your early younger days, what were your career aspirations as, as far back as you can go and as crazy as it may have seemed? Well, if we're going to go too far back, I think uh, I was asked this question in kindergarten and I kept the piece of paper and I told him I wanted to be a tank. Oh, I straight geez. wanted to be a tank, not not a guy operating it. I wanted to be a tank. And mm -hmm. It took me a little while to come to terms with it. that wasn't an option. Yeah. So I, I think I went through Space Cowboy and a couple of others before I settled into reality. And right out of the gate, I think I wanted to be in law enforcement. And oh. it's a little cliche and weird, but kind of right out of high school, I was in a small town and a lot of my family was absolutely terrible and on the wrong side of the law. And I thought, how neat would it be? Like almost my inspiration was almost completely ironic. <laughs> like how neat would it be if my whole family's in jail and I'm a police officer? <laughs> so I started that for, I started to go after that for a while in high school, but then my career in manufacturing just took off faster than going after my license. Okay, so how did you end up in man? Not end up. That sounds like a negative tone. How did you totally land is. in manufacturing? Well, believe it or not, I am extroverted by nature. <laughs> I might not come out there, but I can't relate to introverted people at all. I, sometimes I'll talk to a brick wall if there's no humans around. And I worked at a hotel, Comfort okay. Suites, overnight. And my job was just put out the breakfasts and smile at people and check them in and check them out, right? And I've worked there for just about six years and a little more time even afterwards on a part-time basis. Loved the job, loved everyone I met. And there was an annual manufacturing meeting there with a company I would ultimately go to work for called Clayton Supply. And I would set out like their meeting space and set up their projector and whatever other stuff they had to do and chat. And I got to know everybody because the same folks come in and out. And then one day they just said, hey, you got a nice enough attitude. You could you could survive in my office. And they took me with them. Okay. And, and so they took you, but you stayed. What kept you there? So I was married at the time, and I decided that we were going to buy a home early in my life. It's around 21 at the time. And I kept both jobs full time. I worked at Clayton Homes and Comfort Suites full time. All right. And it, it was a, a very miserable thing because as soon as I left one job, I go to the other for the full eight hours, not part time, not split shifts, both jobs full time for a little over a year. I put saving up money, got into my first house, and then I had had such an impact at Clayton. They said, what would it take for you to not do that to yourself anymore? And I told them and they made it happen. That's amazing. So from working two full time jobs, that's serious, man. What lessons, or rather, how did that, how does that contribute to your passion for making things better? I think anybody that uh, truly knows me in my, in my tighter circle, they know I want it more than you. Whoever mm. you compare it to right out of the gate, I want it more than you. And uh, it's sharing that passion with the world daily in all the ways that I can. Um, in my warehouse days, I would wake up four or five in the morning, my first hour at home, I just solve all the email, all the leadership crap you have to solve in a day. Yep. And then I go to work and I spend the full day at work just interacting with people. What's actually happening today? What are the gaps that could actually take place? What's a way I could expand your tool belt to solve these problems when they come up in the future? And that's been the, my most impactful parts of my career. Yes. Fulfilling? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me wake up in the morning and write oh, books. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so what what early missteps did you have with people early on into your CI learning? 
Well, I had this false presumption. I know it's going to sound rare, but that humans are logical creatures. <laughs> <laughs> And that has been continuously proven false again and again and again. And I thought, if I can just present, well, here's statistically why this makes sense. is going to make you a million dollars. Everyone's going to cling to it and run. And everybody's like, you're an asshole. We don't care. <laughs> We're just clocking in and out. I don't know why you're in here asking these questions. And it's taken a lot of, I, I went from about 90, 95% data gathering and reengineering new processes all the way down to like, that's less than 5% of what I do. 90, 95% mm. I want to do is gather consensus on what we want to change and then work on the rate of acceptance on actually getting them to do that change. Oh my goodness, yes. So how did you build those muscles? So through a, a lot of failure, a trial and tribulation. So <laughs> I first had to do it wrong about a hundred ways. And then I had to spend all the time I could learning the theoretical approaches aren't necessarily what reality is about, but they're all tools in your tool belt to Socratically apply when necessary. Have you gathered a larger number of friends the more you adapted to a human approach? Well, that's a rough question for me because like outside of work, it's weird because a lot of times life just, your life self and your work self are two different people entirely. But almost all of my human life outside of work being a robot, I was really personable. I had a lot of friends, connect with just about everybody from a very diverse group all the time. Like that was never a struggle for me. And then at work, it was like I was this whole other person. That's, you know, mm. a robot focused on how do I make the most money? How do I maximize the value for the company? What are the IQ 420 plays I can think through tomorrow <laughs> so I can, you know, be psychically better than everyone else? And as I slowly scaled that back, I found just being more of myself naturally, uh, just about everybody is a fan after that. Just just about everybody. Yeah, yeah. So where, do you, where would you say the thinking comes from around, I've got to be mechanical in nature in order to achieve success? Where does that come from? You know, that is a fantastic question. But I think there's a there's a huge gap between what we would call our frontline associates from leadership okay. and that we incompetently just promote the best performer. That's what we do is, you know, you're not the best leader. You're not a group you know, guy. We don't even know how to really articulate what we want out of a leader most of the time. And we just go, you move pallets on a forklift the fastest. Welcome to leadership. But <laughs> well, uh, you know, that's, a, that's always where the career starts is you're an hourly associate. You work hard to move forward. You think that. Finding out how to work harder and harder is the way forward forever. And that's unfortunately not how reality works. Yeah. Would you be surprised if I told you it's the same in construction? Oh, oh, totally. I thought construction <laughs> was a very, very engineered, fantastic place that had all of its questions figured out. Oh, yeah, no, no. There's plenty of opportunity. Lots and lots and miles and acres of room for improvement. And the the most frequent because you get all kinds of pushback and doubt and like this ain't gonna happen blah 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 but the most frequent response is jesse that stuff works great in manufacturing but this ain't manufacturing you know and it's like but we have people <laughs> right we like the theory <laughs> is the same i get the specifics aren't but the theory is the same it, I'm very curious, when you run a construction project, if you are going to actually like dig a hole somewhere, how many people do you have to hire to watch the hole? Yeah. <laughs> I've always wanted to know that from an expert. Like, what is the number that's ideal for watching that guy actually work? I guess the, the appropriate answer would be it depends on the depth of the ditch and the specific system that's going in the ditch. And, and, you know, the reason I say depth of the ditch, so let's say we're digging a ditch that's in excess of four feet deep. We're going to require shoring so that nobody gets crushed on a potential collapse. And so you're going to have a backhoe operator. You you may have somebody shooting grade to make sure we're not over digging, right, to minimize that junk. That same person will likely be able to handle the shoring unless we wanted to be cheap and buy or rent the really heavy shoring. So now you need two people to manage that. You have the backhoe operator. 
And then, of course, you have me, right, supervisor or foreman or somebody in that level that, of course, feels like if I'm present, things are just going to be perfect. So in that case, you would have three spectators, part-time spectators, because they are actually there to, to do something. But it's not required. <laughs> I would say there's my improvement number one. I have never dri driven down a construction project and not seen five guys. Yep, that's always digging. I liken it to tongs. If you're ever out grilling, there is not a man on this earth that doesn't pull the tongs out and give them a couple of test clicks. Those those tongs work. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I thought they wouldn't, but we were going to give them a couple of testing. Oh yeah, no, we we've. Are you familiar with Lean Enterprise Institute? Yes. Okay, so we've had a co-learning partnership with them, and one of their instructors, Bryant Sanders, amazing. I mean, he has transformed my thinking. But we walked the job site, big old data center, and I could see he was like itching in his skin. I'm like, what's going on? And he's like, there's just so many people standing around. And I was like, yeah. He's like, but that's not what bugs me. I said, okay, well, so like, what is it? He's like, y'all don't seem to be bothered by it. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, well, it's construction, right? In my head, that was my frame of reference. But once he took me down the path of, of understanding how to improve things i could see like oh wow like it's not just construction we just have a lot of work to do to improve the damn thing and then fundamentally if if the people that are with more responsibility don't see it as a problem that's a big enormous problem and i think that's what he was responding to and and your observations of the ditch echo that <laughs> Yeah, I, it, I, what I found in leadership is more often than not, there's more unlearning that has to happen oh, than, yes. than learning. Is I, I have to stop being okay with X or Y, or I have to stop like accepting this in my norm. And that's really hard to do. If you've done something for 21 days, that's your habituation. That's who you are as a person. You know, my couch will tell you, like, is that a lean guy? <laughs> Probably not. I love it. My couch, my couch got dirt on me. <laughs> the uh, tech time there is just. <laughs> love it. Okay, so you got into manufacturing, finally stopped working 16 hours a day, discovered continuous improvement. And, I, you know, I, I haven't met anybody yet that's in that realm of, of work that didn't really screw it up and piss a lot of people off out the gate. So I'm glad, I, you know, like, I want to find that person so that I could learn from them so I could pass that knowledge on to the next person that I'm, you know, developing or working with. But also I'm glad to, to not be miserable all by myself, Jake. Yeah, uh, it's, it's much more about sharing pain than it, is, than it is pleasure. Well, you know, if you win all the time, you think, you end up thinking, it's because of you. Success is a poor teacher. Yeah, narcissism is like rampant. Like the second that you you haven't been told no often enough, you're like, all right, well, it's just my esoteric presence that's causing success all around me. And that's why every project is run into perfection. And there's humans that actually believe that. You'll see these posts on LinkedIn. It's like, I just have the right undescribable X factor. And when I'm around, the projects go. And I'm like, no, you had a lot of good people that made the projects go, and you were kind of worth it. Oh, yeah. Can you think back and describe what was going on inside you when you realized that the people out there doing the work were the key? Well, I reflected a year after the event happened to me, and it's totally changed the my mode of living. And so in my in my glory days in manufacturing, we had a truck, regular pickup truck. And if all else failed and our, you know, all of our deliveries are just in time. So everything delivers that day that a facility is going to manufacture with that day. And there is no backup, no safety stop go. So anytime something wasn't perfect, you had to go get approval from the GM to put it in the truck. And if there was nobody else, you were driving it there yourself. Just about got to that situation with one of my customers. And I go to find my general manager who's out in the warehouse somewhere. And I find him, and before I even get done describing the situation, he said, Jake, I've never seen you make a bad decision. If that's what you feel you need to do, I encourage you to just do it. And I took off, and I realized how that completely changed my mode of thinking, and that that's where my career took off. 
And reflecting back on that, because it was about a year later, I'm like, how do I get every person I interact with to feel that way? Mm. The way I did, where I had unlimited power, permission, and value was the only thing that mattered. And that's kind of what shaped my direction going forward. Oh, man, that is well said, my friend. Damn, that's powerful. Yeah, my wonder- name is Ryan Powell, and he is he is on my LinkedIn. Like I said, he is a, he's somebody that's changed the way I do business. So you've had a, a string of, of amazing leaders. Yeah, the ones I talk about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's also a string of maybe. <laughs> Absolute shit bags and my ex-wife, and they're all in another circle. It doesn't get addressed unless it's humorous. Now, in, in terms of learning, like they say, volume of lessons learned through observation, what's the ratio between lessons learned from less than amazing leaders and amazing leaders? What's the ratio for you? Well, there's a lot of inspirational things I've taken from great people I've had in my life, but just about every fundamental lesson has come from somebody terrible making the worst <laughs> decision. Like just about everyone. I would say 99 to 1. Why <laughs> the hell would you do that? That's where we learn and go forward. I, I feel you, man. I finally figured out how to be a half-decent foreman. So I got promoted to superintendent. Like just here's the keys, here's the keys to the truck, here's a computer, go be super. And and one of the guys asked me, like, Jess, like, aren't you worried? I'm like, no, like, why not? It's like, because all I have to do is not be like him. <laughs> and I'll be doing okay. That's the bar. People are gonna love me if I'm just not an absolute shitbag. Yes. I posted, I posted one a couple of months ago that was like my employee retention approach not treat them like absolute shit. <laughs> like, what a fantastic approach. I don't know where that came from. I don't need a pizza to do that. But it's it's displaying appreciation for them as human beings. Listening to them, giving them space. Like, anybody that does that for me, they're on my top 10 list. Like, if they just, they don't really even have to listen to me. If they just don't say anything while I'm rambling on, I feel heard. And they're now my favorite person. It's a puppy dog approach. I don't know how to explain it without sounding uncharitable, but what are the steps you do with your dog? You make sincere eye contact, you you over-engage your expressions, and you acknowledge whatever their actual behavior is. Like that, mm. That's literally all there is to it. As long as you're doing those things, that's what I want done to me. I want somebody telling me the actions I've taken are correct. And I appreciate where you are and how you got there, even if the direction is different going forward. Dude, you're imparting some like real wisdom how much of this wisdom is in chasing X? So I set out to provide all of it. So I intentionally made the book is in the third party industry. I don't know how to say it without attacking other people, but you kind of get the bottom of the barrel where, I mean, I say that because I am in that industry yeah. <laughs> there. So the bar is not that high, right? Yeah, so yeah. the people that I work with, including myself, like, haven't read, haven't read a book in 10 years. Mm-hmm. So step one, make the book very straightforward. So it's only 114 pages. Nice. That's how this book is. It's 14 chapters, and there's not a chapter that's more than five, six pages long. And they're asynchronous, so you don't have to read them in all in order. You don't have to read it like a big story to teach yourself. You can just take one in at a time. And it starts with, here's the fundamentals. Here's a theory you need to learn about how to solve problems. And then here's how you actually do it. And then here's a tool to help you do it for yourself in the future. And it's both professional and personal and a nice blend of the two. But I intentionally went back through the book and took out seven letter words and complex okay. effort, theoretical quotations to Socrates and Diogenes. And I just yep. made it simple and straightforward and hitting as it can with the tool for you to do it yourself. How nerve wracking was it to actually put it out there in, into the world? You know, I struggled with that and around that motion quite a bit. So right as I went to publish the book, my social media had just started actually growing as well. And I had never been in that scene before, really. I mean, I was on Facebook a little bit, but not intentionally trying to grow it with the public. And I was stuck for a while on, man, it's only going to take one wrong person on LinkedIn to just go, let's slice this whole man's career. But <laughs> uh, I had to push past that. Like, if there's one guy that doesn't like my stuff, okay, who cares? Even right now, somebody we've had on the podcast, somebody that I connect with and we go back and forth loving each other's content. He hated it it for him. Like that some parts I I wasn't too serious and some parts I was too serious and it wasn't for him. And I'm like, 
that's totally fine. Yeah. Like, where's the world where we can't have good discourse? Like, I appreciate you, man. So have you done an audio version yet? I have not. And you know what? About half of my connections are overseas. And I'm, oh. so I'm just starting to break into that world. And I have one lady, uh, her name's Patricia, that we kind of go back and forth and connect regularly. And she mm -hmm. loves my Texas accent. And I thought, I'm just going to do the audio version just for that group of people. I'm going to over embellish like, well, Hattie, folks, well, today <laughs> here we're going to go through a chasing excellence. <laughs> oh, man. You know, you got to wear a buckle and a hat when you record it like you got to go full method actor on this well so one of my friends uh was like that could be misinterpreted as like some sort of appropriation but i'm like i'm born and raised in texas if anybody gets to do it it's me i'm allowed you guys can't do it i can do it <laughs> well it is kind of back to the point of yes you may offend somebody that's not your intent yeah. uh, just like the book yes there's probably going to be people that don't like it and guess what? They get permission to not like it. Like, yep. it's okay. You They're have permission to be offended and you have permission to not like it. And I still love you. Yeah. One of the chapters is about having no frame of reference for a problem and still logically working through the solution. Mm. And so I start the chapter by, all right, you're abducted by aliens and you're on this new planet. Here's this wacky set of problems going on. <laughs> and, you know, sh these straight laced, you know, MBA guys that open the book and read it, they're like, what the? is this but i'm really st scratching at the creative side of your brain and saying here's how i solve something i know nothing about and then mm. i give you the specific tools to do that so if, with problems which ones are your favorite problems are the ones that you know the least about or the ones you know the most you know what that's a that's a really biased question and <laughs> if i were going to answer that i would say it's the ones i start off thinking i know the most about those uh, are always the best ones because I start there and I have a mastery of this subject and I've done it for 10 years and I know exactly what I'm talking about. And I go and look at it and go, well, shit, that's totally new. <laughs> I was wrong. Damn it. Yeah, well, I remember one time. So one of my maintenance ops took a picture of a dock plate out in the warehouse. And they're like, well, look at this big dent on it. Somebody had to have hit it with this clamp while they were going in and out of the trailer. And I'm just thinking to myself, the dock ramp was angled down. The clamp picks up. Even if the clamp is on the ground, there's no logical way that would ever happen. So I messaged back really quick. Like, I've been doing this for 10 years. I see the picture, the dent. Had to come from XYZ instead of ABC. And I walked out there, and I was so far off, so far diverged from whatever could have actually happened to what really did. That's when you you really grow. If you have the fortitude and the integrity, you go, yeah, man, I was wrong. I stand corrected. Mm-hmm. Well, in, in the critical thing there, which is probably simple in your mind, but for a lot of a lot of people that I've dealt with, actually going out and seeing what the hell's really happening, like that's how you discovered it. And, and, and too many people, leaders, I'll say, too many leaders attempt to or believe they're solving problems from behind the desk. Have you experienced any of that? Oh, oh, yeah. So when I posted a, a, a GIF meme where I'm rubbing a, a genie lamp and it says, you want three wishes, what would you like your first one to be? And I'm like, I wish all decisions were made where the work is. <laughs> My first wish is you are not allowed to make a decision unless you are standing on top of it looking at it. Because otherwise, mm. it's a biased one. And I like to, not to overcomplicate my math, but if you imagine the industry standard as a very flat line on an XY plane, so that's the industry standard. It's ever growing, ever in the same direction. It's constantly getting better. And every time we're not challenging that, we're diverging from that line. Mm -hmm. And so what you get is these guys who I've been an executive for 20 years. And what I thought was the industry best isn't even recognizable to what's actually happening now. So I sit in a, in a chair and anything I say doesn't even sound coherent anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to make decisions for people that can't even relate to what the problems are. So. Yeah, I mean, that's the primary factor. Did you actually go out and see what was wrong? Did you actually take feedback from the people who committed the defect? I worked in a lot, a lot of very large organizations where the perpetrator or the evil bastard that had the defect was never even consulted again, even when they had the corrective action, even when it first went wrong. I'm like, how did you expect to change anything when our whole business is human behavior? Mm. I got zero feedback from anybody the entirety of the time I worked there. Oh, by the way, we're firing that guy. 
Well, did you did you even talk to him about what he did wrong? Yeah. Well, but they should know. Like, oh, really? Like, how? When somebody says common sense, that just boils my oh. blood. I'm like, do you think we should just have not have school at all? Everybody has innate common sense. Mm -hmm. like, everyone has the psychic ability to know exactly what's right and what's wrong from my personal frame of reference at all times. No, the hell they don't. I hear words like the phrases like that. It's common sense. Like, clearly it's not. You, every time you're saying that, it's an indicator that it is not, or they should have known, like, oh, my God. Okay, so now you didn't secure a commitment and or you didn't communicate the expectation. That's why you're saying should, because you were operating on an assumption. Mm -hmm. And then the response is, well, it's common sense. Okay, you answered your own question, but you don't understand. You still don't understand. Yeah, and then some people take it too far where now on the other end of the spectrum, we've had training and the guy knows specifically what to do on a standardized document. And we're going to re-update that document every single day and we're going to force people to sign it and go on with their lives twice a week on Saturdays. This this is also the same set of waste. Like this is at some point superfluous quality. And I don't think we talk about that end of it enough where we never address human behavior and we go, oh, I need to retrain this. 500 times, whatever. I mean, it's pretty easy. All humans, and there's a part about it in this bad boy, need two things. And they need an incentive for doing the right thing and a decentive for not doing the right thing. That's mm. just human nature. I'm a monkey. I'll be the first to admit it. If the missus is going to come home and cook dinner, well, guess what? If I beat her home, I'm going to clean up around the place. Or I'm going to text her sweet little nothings because you know what? She's going to make dinner tonight. Have both. That's how humans are built. And if you just, well, I'm just going to give a vague hint at what you should do. And every time you're wrong, I'm going to attack you for it. Then you don't ever make a relationship that actually works. It's undefined because we don't know what value you're seeking. And if I don't know what value you're seeking, I cannot provide it to you. And bitching at me does not help me understand the value you're seeking. <laughs> I hope she doesn't watch this. In this review, that was not about you. What he said, when he said bitching, that was not me. <laughs> Absolutely not. I would not refer <laughs> reference you there at all, Rebecca. You're awesome. While we're in the danger zone, think back, and you can go as, as raw and painful. Actually, I prefer that you go as raw and painful as possible. What was the biggest misstep you've made that has provided you with the greatest learning? So my learnings are years to separated from my missteps. So I grew up in a very, very poor household. Oh man, it was about to get good and I'm pulling the carpet out from under you. If you want to get to know Mr. Jake Harrell just a little bit better and maybe leverage some of the painful learnings that he had so you don't have to repeat them, hit us up on patreon.com slash learnings and missteps. You will get this exclusive content along with other good stuff. And like my good friends Reed and Hunter say, it's all about the fans only, baby. Back to the show. I get the feel. The energy you put off says that you've embraced that which is Jake Harrell. And, and I imagine that that wasn't easy. Well, I don't imagine. I still struggle with embracing that because it's um it's a thing we're, we're human beings and we we got our own issues and did you take one look at me and said it must have been hard for you to embrace yourself <laughs> lean is not sexy folks i like to think everything in life is a rorschach test are you familiar with the rorschach test yes i i think everything in life is that it is just a reflection of like your own intentions you put out in the world mm. like i i had a boss where i worked in my previous life where in the break room there were four tvs but he would come out at everyone's break and turn on the TV and take the remote back with him into his office. And I'm like, why Why would that be the case? I'm like, well, I don't trust these people, the 500 people in my warehouse, to operate the TV and not you know, put it on something terrible or whatever might have you. But I kind of don't trust you with my TV, buddy. <laughs> if you came over to my house, I would not leave you alone with my remote. <laughs> I'm like, yep. That says a lot more about you. And I kind of apply that to these people that are overly focused in the political realm we're in today. 
Sure. They'll have a very hard opinion about something that's very, I'm like this, or you're evil, or part of the satanic elite, or whatever it is. And I'm like, mm, that's kind of a you thing there, buddy. <laughs> that's what society is not talking about this. That is a you thing. They're projecting, right? They're projecting their yeah. their beliefs and their thoughts all outward. And, and, and I wish we could press a button to help people see that. But that button hasn't been created yet. And they get to do that. They're human beings. You mentioned a podcast. You're six episodes in. Is that correct? So they just posted seven. I wasn't a part as I was traveling, as we previously discussed. They just posted episode seven. My buddy called it episode eight when he uploaded it. And so now we're all <laughs> laughing on LinkedIn. It's episode seven and three quarters. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Having a good time with it. But yeah, that's where we are today. What is the name of this podcast? I need to check it Any out. Quality Podcast. A quality, a quality podcast. Okay, it's a podcast about quality, and it's yeah, available on YouTube. Yeah, if you hop on to my LinkedIn profile and look at articles, the last like two or three articles I wrote, I, we had a guest on, and I made a funny article where I, I either poke at somebody's life or their background, and you'll make it humorous in some way, and then I point you where you can go watch the episode. All right, we'll make sure we get people out there to know about it because I think, rather, I know that you're perspective and energy can help win people over and, and better contribute to, to the efforts that that you're dispelling your energy on. Because really, at the end of the day, it's about making things better for people. I mean, for me, it is anyways. How do I make it better for people? How do I help people have the, the experience you described of, wow, I can make a difference and people trust me and and because of that, I now have agency over what it is I'm doing going forward. So you've had some amazing, you had Mr. John Thacker, Mr. Ryan Powell as your leaders. And clearly you've taken a lot from what they've imparted to you and built upon that. You have Chasing Excellence, which is, sounds like a fun read. I'm going to have to read it. I guess I can order that on Amazon. There you can. Okay. There's links uh, on my LinkedIn page as well. Awesome. Links on the know, LinkedIn page. My LinkedIn page isn't below me, but for some reason I did that. <laughs> there's, there's like fancy, and I don't know, there's fancy software. A buddy of mine, Felipe Engineer Manriquez, he's into live streaming. And, and I say he's into it. I'm into it too because I live stream with him. But I don't, I'm not the operator, so I don't know how the hell he does all that stuff. But he can put things on the bottom and on the top and all kinds of fancy stuff which is way beyond uh, my capabilities. So, but having spent time with amazing leaders like that, and clearly you also are an amazing leader, how do you intend to affect the world going forward? That's the question. I think that that answer for me has changed just about every year over the past three years. Okay. So it, it had initially started with, how do I, I think my initial goal was just be the general manager of anywhere, house anywhere, because then I'm in control of everyone in that entire town that comes in and out, and I can touch and add positive value to every person that comes through. Mm. Well, after last year, I was like, well, why don't I expand that circle a little bit and just go after the world? And that's what I've been slowly building on LinkedIn was I'm trying to create that button you were talking about earlier where you can read it, laugh, and when you laugh, you don't immediately dismiss the idea. You laugh at it first and consider whatever the idea is. So I'm trying to point at, you know, can we smile? Can we not make it work such a terrible black and white cutthroat place? Can we still have a passion for it? Can we rely on tools and systems to get the outcomes we want instead of, you know, yelling at each other and tearing each other down? And so as I land here today, John's comments, uh, so we went out camping. And if you look at my YouTube page, it's both of us holding machetes in the middle of the forest. And... He said something over the fire that night, and he said, I don't care if I don't have anything else more than what I have today, mm. but I just want to touch and turn everything into gold and get everybody to this level and beyond with where they are in life. And I haven't found a better a reason to keep going than that there. Yeah. Oh, man, that that is that is a solid and noble aspiration. When we started communicating about having this interview, I fully expected uh, sense of humor. <laughs> and you delivered, my man, you delivered. 
but your appreciation and display of leadership, I applaud you, man. You got it going on, Jake. You really do. So do you have any any final thoughts or final questions? I, I do. I do. Oh. Just give me one moment because I need to grab something and show it to you. So this here is my John Wilson Packer ball. In <laughs> January of this year, he moved from Dallas to halfway across the country in the Maryland, PA area, a thousand miles away. And since I was cast away on an island by myself, I purchased this ball when I sent him the video. And it is my constant daily reminder to, hey, don't treat people like shit. <laughs> and uh, one of the philosophies he carries with him is it starts with, hey, if you actually like people, the rest of it's not that hard. And <clears throat> what I carry forward in life. Well, what did y'all think about that? That was a pretty damn good conversation. The interesting thing is Jake is very charismatic and very funny. And that coupled with his deep appreciation for people and understanding of leadership is a rare combination. Check the episode notes for links to all of his stuff, to his YouTube channel, to his LinkedIn profile. Blow them up. Leave us some thoughts about what you think. And for my construction folks that caught this episode, you may be thinking, or you may even have said, you know, that well, that's all manufacturing. That's all third-party logistics. What does that have to do with construction? Well, I'm here to tell you, man, he's talking about people and leadership. And if you ain't got that out on your job site, you got bigger problems than to worry about the relationship between manufacturing and construction. And of course, we want to recognize members of the LM family that have not only been listeners and supporters, but went out of their way to give us some feedback. This is a shout out to my carnal, Chris Castro. Chris and I, and a whole bunch of other cats, we've been friends all the way back to the Tafoya days. Shout out to them Tafoya Toros. Chris Castro left us a note saying, I like the real talk that you and Renee bring out, your personal experiences and familiarity with the guests you bring on. It's like a 45 minute platica. Seems to end very quickly for me. Chris, I'm glad, man, because if you remember, I've always been a pretty damn good talker. Uh, Chris, thanks for supporting us. And also want to give a shout out to all you folks that are hitting us up on the Google Podcasts app. We've had a sudden rise in listeners, and that is not a complaint. We are grateful. Thank you all. Be cool. And we'll talk at you next time. Man, you are one dedicated listener sticking with us all the way through to the very, very end. Please know that this podcast dies without you. And we invite you to share how the episode's impacting you, along with your thoughts, questions, and suggestions. You have been gracious with your time, so we added social media links in the show notes to make it super easy for you to connect with us. Be kind to yourself, stay cool, and we'll talk at you next time.